sin reigned, sin reigned because being committed with very few limitations or hindrances. One was the conscience. Work of the law is written in the conscience. The other was a law written in the hearts. So that was like the only inhibiting factors. But there were some distinctions about that first period. Number one, there was no law. <coughs> That's why the scriptures say until the law. So there was no law. So That's distinction number one. Distinction number two, sin was not imputed. For, as Paul says, sin is not imputed when there is no law. That's distinction number two. Distinction number three, sin reigned without the law. That's, that's a, it's the only period of the world's history that that's true. Sin reigned without the law. And lastly, there were periods of ignorance at which God winked <coughs> during that period. So the time from Adam to Christ, also had some distinctions. That would be from Adam through the time of Moses up to Christ. It has some distinctions. For example... <coughs> Very little was known, hardly anything was known about the gospel and about God's eternal purpose and his salvation. Peter draws attention to this, and he mentions the prophets who spoke of Christ, but like they didn't really know what they were talking about. They didn't know who he was or when he was going to appear. And Peter brings that to our attention, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched. So they tried to, they wanted to know, inquired and searched, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, searching what, what man or what manner of time this spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified before unto the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed, so how long they searched and that until this happened we don't know but it revealed that not unto themselves this message wasn't for them how sad <coughs> this message was not for them <coughs> not unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us <laughs> they prophesied for us we're in Christ they did minister the things which are now reported to you by them that have preached the gospel with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things angels, that's how deep these things are, angels desire to look into. Amen. I'm establishing now that not only was there no law, sin wasn't imputed, no longer did that exist, was that, but they didn't know anything, anything about what you experienced in Christ. These people knew absolutely nothing about it. Not even during the prophetic age, plumb up to Malachi. They, they had bits and pieces about it, but they didn't experience anything like we do. Now, Paul makes the point that what God had determined to do was, was purposefully kept secret. This is an on on purpose thing. There's some people God does not want them to know. This has got to get through to people, I'll tell you. You say, I think he wants everybody to know now. He does not want people who rebel against him to know, and he'll not let them know. Amen. They'll not be able to figure it out. They can study the Bible from now to Jesus comes, and it'll not make sense. Then why doesn't everybody know? Yeah. Is God God or not? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. It's been unveiled now, but only, only mm -hmm. to those who are in Christ. Amen. Only their eyes are opened. Nobody else's is, and you will never 
in all your life talk to or hear of a person that's not in Christ that has any kind of intelligent view of what God is doing. It's just hidden. Now, here's how Paul put it. Unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which is kept secret since the world began. So God purposely hid what he was doing. See, and knowing what he's doing does affect how you live or how you think. Again, he said in Ephesians 1, 9, have he made known unto us the mystery of his will. In the Bible, mystery, when you read mystery, it means it's something that was hid, but now it's been opened up. Again, he said in Ephesians 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. In Ephesians 3, 9, his aim was to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, the burden of this mystery was revealed to Paul. We hold in reverence all of the other inspired writers and all the other apostles. We do. None of them received what Paul did. But when Paul made known to them what he preached, Peter and James, who were chief figures of the Jerusalem church, they saw this is the truth. And they gave him the right hand to fellowship. But see, it wasn't revealed. To, to, it was revealed particularly to Paul, and it was revealed particularly for the Gentile church, from which it has been withheld in our day. Do you think for one moment that these pretentious ministers who have preached for years and years and years and years and have not made this mystery known to their people, do you think they're going to be excused? They are unfaithful stewards. See, well, they don't understand. Then they need to step down out of the pulpit and get out of that business of preaching till they know what they're talking about. Too much is at stake here. We got people living today the same way Jacob lived, in a state of ignorance. Someone's going to account for this. So let's go over again what, what was unique about it. Sin reigned without law. There was no law. Sin was not imputed. The eternal purpose of God was not revealed. The mystery of Christ was not known, and it was a time of ignorance in which God winked. <clears throat> now, those are all matters of revelation that I gave you there. They should temper our judgment. Some people say, well, they just launched right out against, against these saints back there as though they had a whole a Bible sitting before them. I don't doubt that when Moses recorded these events, it pained his heart. I, I don't, not because he is a critical man, but because he's, his mind and heart have been cultured by the presence of Almighty God. And I know this, this was offensive to him, but he, he understood why. That's why he didn't register, the Holy Spirit didn't lead him to shoot arrows of conviction, at the arrows of criticism at these saints because they were living at a time when there was no law. I said there was no law. Well, the prophets later on in generations <coughs> did level very pointed Yeah, but not at these people. Words. No, not no. at these people. To their words. audiences. Yeah, mm -hmm. to their... Because they had been exposed to this. As soon as people were exposed, then, then yeah. the excuse making is gone. As soon as God has spoken, whether the person has heard it or not, if God has spoken, it's the people's business to find out what he said. If they're the queen of Sheba, to get in a boat and go to Jerusalem to find out. So there's no excuse for people in the United States of America not knowing the truth. There is no excuse. 
Anybody in this country can get a Bible any time they want. They can get any version they want. They can get it. See, the God, once God speaks, the excuses are knocked off the table. There aren't any more. That, and that's, that's what Brother Gene's pointing out. When the law was given, uh, we didn't tolerate sin anymore. God didn't wink at it like he did then, and he, didn't wink, he doesn't wink at it at all now. When the law was given, there were great na body nations that were in this state of ignorance that he winked. But he didn't wink at Israel, did he? He didn't wink at it. The law died in the wilderness. <laughs> That's right. The things God had revealed. And we're, we're coming in contact with God here, see. We're becoming acquainted with God. This is the way God is. This man be pan be God that's been held up to this generation is not God. He's no more God than Allah is. And the Jesus there preaching is no more a savior than Muhammad is. They're, these gods and Jesus are in the same category as Allah and Muhammad. They're not real. This is the real God we're being Amen. acquainted with here. <coughs> now, these were less than ideal circumstances, to say the least. But we got God, the perfect worker, and he's going to work his will out in these. Yeah. Where, where the death reigned, where there is no law, sin is not imputed, God's still going to work out his purpose. Yeah. So we shouldn't expect it to be the same way he, d he did later. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't expect it to be. A part of the things, <coughs> well, I made a little uh, chartology here. I'll give you what I'm going to teach throughout this lesson. That God winked at what happened in this. This is an example of God winking in this 22nd chapter. That's 27th chapter. God winking at sin. No law was present. All right, that changed how they conducted themselves. And even though technically what they did was wrong from the standpoint of the law, it, the sin isn't imputed. Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with these preachers that have imputed it? They've got up in pulpits and they've imputed sin to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done it deliberately. Yeah. And to Sarah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's going to be a sad day yeah, right. when they stand before God and the question's going to come up. I didn't impute it. Yeah. Why did you? Yeah. Amen. They'll have to answer. And I pray they'll be ready. So the next time you hear someone say this, yeah. like rebuke them. <laughs> Don't be tolerant of it because this stuff's not right. That's right. We've got God Almighty didn't impute sin to them. So I'm going to do it? No, sir. Ponder the things that you know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't know. All right, you know the definition of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. They didn't. They didn't know a single offering was going to be made that would perfect forever them that are sanctified. They didn't know that. They didn't know the sin of the world had to be taken away in total. They didn't know all men are in a state of alienation from God. This hadn't been made known. They didn't know the world would be reconciled to God. They didn't know the judgment, the condemnation took place when Adam sinned. What it says in Romans 5, 9, 5, 16. Judgment because Adam, not because Adam and Eve, because Adam sinned, there came judgment to condemnation. That means the end of judgment was condemned. The human race was condemned right there in the garden. Amen. The human race was condemned. Right. In total. Yeah. That's a teaching of scripture now. They didn't know by one righteous man righteousness would come to men. They didn't know that. They didn't know that by one man's disobedient many were made sinners and by one man's obedience, many would be made righteous. They didn't know that the preeminent gift of God is eternal life. 
<laughs> what did what did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob know about eternal life? Nothing. Solomon didn't even know anything about it. In all his wisdom, eternal it, that word's not in any any of his writings. And if you read his view of death, you start. It shouldn't be your view. Because life and immortality were brought to light by the gospel. We're, we're greater than Solomon's risen. He's defined these things Amen. a little more clearly. <coughs> they didn't know that there was going to be a new and a different kind of generation come from the Messiah. No, who shall declare his generation, Isaiah would say hundreds of years later. Jesus had just children, but they're different kind of children. They're not children like Jacob and Joseph. Now, Isaac, they're not children. They're different, a different kind of generation. But they didn't know this. They didn't know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They didn't, they didn't know that. Some of the Job, David, some of them had little hints, but not much. Yes. Even men who are reasonable will come to this conclusion with their own children. In our home, Aaliyah isn't judged by the same standard that Judah is. That's right. of the level of knowledge. That That's right. Uh-huh. Amen. Now, I don't see any alternative, as I start in the lesson, to the persuasion, even though it, it, the circumstances are admittedly uncomely, that God is working out his will in this I know that primarily because of how it worked out. So that, that's what tells me this. But this, this is God. Let me tell you. Do you think anybody from this age is going to be able to brag if they get to heaven? <laughs> I do you? They get to these people, they, 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 they won't have their view of themselves that, that we know was that they were sinners like everybody. They didn't have that view of themselves because it wasn't made known, but... These saints of God, when they land safely on the other side, they're going to know it's not of works. Yeah, Jacob's not going to be able to cite this chapter and say, this is, how, this is how he worked it out, Lord. So I'm going to say, this was God working it out. Amen. I'm, and I'm going to establish that. <clears throat> this is an example of God choosing the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and the weak things of the world to confound things that are mighty, base things of the world, things that are despised. <laughs> These kind of answers Jacob gave were like despised. But God used this, work out his purpose. So throughout the generations, all men are going to be able to confess with insight, salvation is of the Lord. In other words, throughout the entire process, commencing with the birth of Seth, there is no point where men will be able to glory. <clears throat> All right, Jacob comes to his father. He came unto his father and said, My father. Now we're going to see in this record the thinking of a person who is lacking in knowledge. He lacks it because it wasn't available. People today lack knowledge, but it's available. That's a different situation. This is not admittedly, what we're going to read here is not admittedly, it's not an example we should follow. <laughs> this, is, this is not how we should uh, try and work our lives out. And it's not given for that purpose. It's different from the example of Abraham. Now, he believed. Now, he did leave an example to follow. He believed. So you have the faith of Abraham, so it was just different, see. But Abraham's response was to the revelation of God. But if it was four times he reaffirmed he was going to bless me to have seed, multitudinous seed. And then it was after he said that, that it said Abraham believed in the Lord and it was imputed in righteousness. So it was his reaction to revelation. Jacob had no revelation. At this point, Jacob had never had any revelation. And Rebecca had one sentence of revelation. <laughs> That's what she had 70 years earlier. <coughs> So the words that were given to Rebecca in particular are this, 70 years earlier, 
The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elders will serve the younger. Nothing about how. Not one syllable about how. No law. Keep in mind, there's no law. He said, but she lied. No, there was no law that said thou shalt not lie. You got to see this, brother. There was no law that said thou shalt not lie. I'm telling you that the lie hadn't been defined yet. Well, they should have known. Who said they should have known? They didn't know. So I can't call it a lie because only the law, by the laws of knowledge of sin, and there wasn't any law. And if you do it by higher standards, it was a sin. God doesn't impute it to them. He doesn't credit sin to them because sin hadn't been defined yet. Yes? What, what brings about a conscience? I mean, would there, is the law, does that well, reinforce the conscience? A conscience is not detailed. That's the difference. A conscience does not spell out the details. It might sense this is not right, but it can't, but it doesn't know the details of it. That's the difference. So there may be some areas of where, well, when he first uh, balked at this plan, that probably was his conscience. That, but the conscience doesn't provide details to the person, unless it's been taught details Amen. by God. That's, that'd be another thing. <coughs> the promise was given only once not four times as it was to Abraham 70 years had passed he looked like nothing was going to happen so they reasoned because they didn't they couldn't they because they couldn't reason otherwise you say well why didn't she go to the Lord like she did with her struggling with the children in the womb there you are Well, see, this is God working this thing out. I'm saying, I'm beginning to see that I don't think God wanted the details to be known at this point. He's going to work the thing out so in the end you'll assess it and say, well, that God could work with that. That means it's not a work. So God worked the thing out. God's nature is, is fixed. It isn't that God was... That lying, deception, this sort of thing. It isn't that this didn't affect God. That is that God is unchangeable. Nothing is going to enter in that defiles. You say, well, why did this? Well, we're talking about on earth, no law, no promise of heaven, no promise of eternal life. It's just what you got, your life on the earth, that's it. That's all anybody knows about. And God's teaching you, if a person's in that state today, they will think wrong. Yeah. Even more so than they did. See, we're seeing this being lived out in this text that without knowledge, you think completely different than if you have knowledge. Yeah. They thought this had been left in their lap. And in a sense, it had. God didn't give any details. He just threw the thing in their lamp. But the whole disposing thereof was of the Lord. So therefore, <laughs> he tells us, I'm, I'm Esau. I have a person who reads, well, if he would have said, I, I, I bought Esau's birthright, so I am the, I am the firstborn by, by rights. He could have said that, but and it, that God wouldn't have worked according to God's purpose. <coughs> Your soul will bless me. You go, come and eat the venison that I made. <laughs> so that was, Now that was Isaac's first test. Are you my son? Who are you, my son? Well, I mean so. You come and eat now. Let's not talk about that anymore. You come and eat that your soul may bless me. <coughs> now apparently Isaac was counting on Esau not only hunting down some game but preparing it. Because 
Isaac had said to him, and, and as Rebecca heard him say it, make me savory meat. So, it, so that's why he said, uh, my venison. And Isaac said to him, my son, I say you, Isaac senses <laughs> something, something's not right here. My son, how is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? <laughs> I mean, normally it takes Esau's out hunting for a while before he gets in a game. You, <laughs> you know, he, Jacob says, well, God brought it to me. So I went out. I went out hunting there, and he just made an animal come to him right away. And we'll be able to tell whether God is in the matter or not, but what, how it all turns out, it's by their fruit. <laughs> is that right? Mm -hmm. By their fruit, you're going to know it by the fruit that yields. If God is not in it, and Jacob is acting in accord only with his own crafty nature this thing won't work. If God is in it, then Jacob is acting contrary to his nature, which is revealed in his initial response to Rebecca. Remember, she's, he said, no, I shouldn't go in because I'm, we're different. Esau is hairy and I'm not. And, and he'll, he'll think I'm a deceiver and I won't have the blessing. See, the people call him a deceiver. They forget that Jacob didn't want to be known as a deceiver. He was afraid of that. I think that, that was his real nature coming out. <laughs> now God has God can move people to do things contrary to their nature. I'll, I'll give you some instances of this. God moved Nebuchadnezzar. Darius and Cyrus to act contrary to their nature by helping build the temple. Like this isn't what they were known for as building temples for Jews. But he moved on them, see, to act contrary to their nature. If he could do that, why can't he move Jacob to act contrary to his nature? So in order that he might establish that it's by election that's what he said. That's what Paul reasoned about this incident, about Jacob being over Esau. He said that, that the purpose of God according to election, Amen. Amen. that's what's being worked out here. Where uh -huh. election might stand. <coughs> also, God has been known to work through lies. This is in his normal mode, to understand. We have a place where he sent a lying spirit to ensure his will would be done in the falling of Ahab. Found in 1 Kings 22. It is also written that those who don't receive the love of the truth, that God will send them strong delusion that they may believe a lie and be damned. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.10. So there in both cases, God worked through a lie. It wasn't, this is not his normal <laughs> mode, and you shouldn't count on it being, but I'm just illustrating to you, that God's got things done by uncomely means. This is only established, only to establish that what God has purpose will be brought to pass, even though it sometimes is by mysterious ways. When you think about it, the whole creation is human race and human sin is a pretty mysterious way. That's right. To bring about the glory That's and, honor right. and righteousness and truth of God. Out of that hodgepodge. It all came from Him. From Him, through Him, and to, to Him. him. See, no wonder Paul said, oh, the, how the unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That's why he said that, well, this is, our text is one of the ways like that. So Isaac has applied two tests thus far. Who are you? And how did you get the game so quick? I'm going to apply the third test now. Isaac said to Jacob, come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. She still doubts about it. Jacob went near unto Isaac, his father. He felled him, and he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Isaac, he's a bit apprehensive. 
you do want to pay attention to your senses, you know, spiritual senses. You just see something about this is not right. So he's steadfast and established it, and for sure this is Esau. Come near, I can touch you. Now Isaac knows that there's a sharp difference between Jacob and Esau. Isaac knows this. If I can just touch them, they, they don't, they don't, I know they don't look alike, but I can't see, so, but I can touch. And I, they're different. I know they're different. I'll be sure to detect it, but see, Rebecca thought, I, thought of this ahead of time, so he felt him, and he went near him, and Isaac, his father, felt him, and he, Jacob had on one of Esau's garments. Remember that Rebecca gave him one of his garments? It apparently was covered everything but the hands and the neck. And that's the part they covered with the goat's hair. <coughs> and this, you can see the liability of blindness. Some things can be detected by other means, like touch, but it's not, it's not as thorough as a sight. Many people have been deceived by what they felt, <laughs> be it because they didn't couldn't see properly. I'm speaking spiritually now here. See, this is never more pronounced in our spiritual lives. If we lack spiritual vision, we'll have wrong feelings. We'll we'll come in contact with things. We'll not be able to tell what they are because of blindness. But the scripture says he discerned him not because his hands were hairy. <coughs> now because he thinks he's, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm dealing with Esau now. So he's going he's gonna to bless him. So he, he blessed him. But this blessing was not the ultimate blessing. That's going to follow. We're going to read about it later. This was like a preliminary blessing. This was like when Jesus breathed on his disciples, remember? said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. But then later he said, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit later. That was, that was the real, yeah. real blessing. This was just, they, when he breathed on that was just introductory. That's what this was. This was an introductory blessing, kind of a summation sort of thing. <coughs> the breathing on the disciples, that didn't make them sufficient to do the work of apostles. Yeah. And this preliminary blessing Jacob got, that wasn't sufficient for him to be the heir. <coughs> now comes the fourth test. He said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. I, mean, I don't know if their voices, the voices had to be measurably different. Be like if Judah tried to disguise his voice like Aaron. He put on one of Aaron's suits and wore his shoes and everything. Said, ah, that feels like the suit, but I had a voice. I'm sure in the sensitivity of Isaac, he was yeah. he wasn't like gullible. Yeah. That's right. So God's working through this thing. And normally you'd have thought he'd have spotted this thing early on. But he didn't. Now, we're faced with a similar dilemma as Isaac was faced with. <coughs> the paramount example of this is our introduction to Babylon the Great. John saw this spiritual monster first as a beast. And the beast spoke like the devil, but had horns like a lamb. He talked different than he. Yeah. <laughs> now that initially portrayed the Roman church when they became like a political entity. But that beast grew up to be a harlot in a great city. Yeah. Heaven faithful city. <laughs> but through all of that, Jesus made this statement that holds true whether Babylon was here or not. My sheep hear my voice, yep. Amen. and I know them, and they follow me. See? There are some people that react to Jesus' voice like Isaac reacted to Jacob's voice. They, 
They suspicion this. They suspicion this is not the right voice, but they follow through anyway. <coughs> now we come to the fifth test. He said, "Art thou my very son Esau?" Do you still? <laughs> he said, "I am." And he said, bring it near to me that I will eat the, of my son's venison that my soul may bless thee. He brought it near to him and he did eat. Art thou my son Esau? I, can just, I know Jacob's heart was erasing. Penetrating question. Because that's what he asked him right out, right out of the chute. That's what he asked him. He said, art thou my, art thou my son? Now he gets to, are my very son, are you, are you really, are you really my son Esau? The other versions say, are you really my son, or are you truly my son? If it was appropriate, there certainly was every opportunity for Jacob to say, I'm Jacob. You know, there's, <laughs> he said, he said, I am, I am. One version says, certainly, <laughs> certainly, of course I am. But Jacob does not hesitate to insist he's Esau, Isaac's eldest son. In his thinking, as well as that of Rebekah, there's no other alternative available to him. That's right. See, there hasn't been any other out, and now he's at, he's at the spot where something has to be done like now. Mm -hmm. We've got no word from God on this, so we're just going to proceed mm -hmm. as we think best. <laughs> and they did. Brother Gibbons, could this be why they were very careful to procure the, the birthright in, in the, for, to satisfy their own minds? That, that well, yeah, it doesn't say Rebecca knew about that. That was Jacob's. But, but it was procured. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if... I think that was God. See, I don't know that Jacob knew. I don't. See, it doesn't say Rebecca ever told anybody about what God said to her. Maybe she did, but it's, it's not in the record. So I'm I'm thinking that that was God working the working the thing out. <clears throat> and Jacob may have had. I'm just not sure. I, I better not say anymore. <laughs> I don't know. So as I say, bring it near to me now, and I'll eat it. So he brought it near. Now he comes to the sixth test. Come near. Other versions say, come close and kiss me. The version says, come near and kiss me. Now the Eastern world still practices this kind of kissing. This is not a kiss connected with lust. This is not a kiss that arouses uh, inappropriate desires. It probably is more like our handshake, kind of like that, except it's a bit more affectionate. This is the word used when it speaks of honoring the son. When the psalmist spoke of honoring the son, he said, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. Account of Jesus gave for the prodigal son, you remember, when the son came back, his father fell on his neck and kissed him. So it is there's affection in it, but it's more like welcome and I'm glad you're here, that sort of thing. One of the great ironies of the betrayal of Jesus is it was done with a kiss. <laughs> That's one of the great ironies of it. When Paul left the brethren at Ephesus, they, they realized he probably would, they'd probably never would see him again. So they fell on his neck and kissed him. And Paul refers to the holy kiss that was practiced in that part of the world. And they still they still do this in the Eastern world. Some people tried to emulate it here, but it uh, didn't, didn't, doesn't go over <laughs> quite the same. <laughs> well, something happened when he kissed him. He smelled the smell of his raiment. Hmm. That's a sixth test. The clothing that Esau wore bore evidence that it belonged to him. He could, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's Esau's cloak, I can tell. It must be Esau. 
Now here's something to think about. Spiritually speaking, believers wear clothing and manners. Sometimes they're borrowed from the world. But those of us that walk with the Lord, we can tell. You've experienced, I know you've experienced, all of you experienced this. You saw some external manner. You, ah, this mm -hmm. just doesn't smell right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> this case, it was, the smell confirmed what he thought, but it's, I'm pointing out here that they're, Jacob and Esau were different. What they wore was different. How they smelled was different. How they looked was different. How they spoke was different. They were different. So are believers from the world. Different. <coughs> so here are, the, here are the six tests. Who art thou, my son? How is it thou hast found it quickly? Isaac felt him. This is the voice of Jacob. But the hands of our Esau, art thou my very son Esau, and the smell of my son is as the smell of a field. What do you mean? This is like a, a blessed field, is the idea. It's a field that emits the type of odor. Solomon spoke of a field like this. It was a garden enclosed. Is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a mountain fountain seal, thy plants are the an orchard of pomegranates, and it's pleasant. He lists all these things. The idea is that it, it's a smell of a person that that is deserving of a blessing. It's, it's a very pleasant type situation. And so he uh, he prepares to bless him. And Isaac is obviously he's making this statement in view of the fact he's going to bless him. So he wants to make sure he's blessing the right person. Oh, this... This smell. This smells like a someone to be blessed. As another example of salvation apart from works, Jacob would not be blessed because of Isaac's words, but because of God's choice. Yeah. Amen. Boy, it's important to know that, because yeah. Jacob didn't know he was blessing Jacob. Uh, Isaac didn't know he was blessing Jacob. He thought he was blessing Esau. But see, God was. God was working out this thing. Now, there's a spiritual parallel here. <coughs> As the saints wear the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness, mentioned in Isaiah 61.10, as they wear that, they emit the fragrance of Christ. <laughs> oh, it's a blessed thing to think about. Amen. We are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. That's just, it's because of the garments of salvation, yeah, see? Right. The fragrance is actually identified with his death. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you get right down to it, it's with his death. That's yeah. what it's identified with. He gave himself a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. See, as his death is what's... And when his death is found in you, that's when you have a savor to God. Amen. That's right. Then you have the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. See? <laughs> so then Isaac blesses Jacob. Brother Gibbons, yes. Before you move too far away from this point of the fragrance, the smell that we give off, I thought people who we're around will detect, they'll, they'll smell the fragrance that we're giving off, and they'll either be attracted to it or they'll be repelled by it. Yeah. And those who are attracted by it recognize it. Or want to be recognized with that smell. So, and it was just recently that some that someone saw us praying in a restaurant. And after we were done praying, she went over to Sister Barbara and said, "That's a very good thing you're doing. It blessed me blesses me to see you doing yeah, that." Yeah, she smelled but, it. Yeah. Then there are, <laughs> then there are some people who see you doing that and then steer clear of you. Yes, Brad. Just they can stay they, away. Yeah, they don't have the. <laughs> Doesn't smell good to them. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I want to note several things before I get into this blessing. No aspect of this blessing applies to the inward man. 
This same goes to all the blessings Moses outlined. Deuteronomy 28. Same thing goes for them. No part of it enhances one's relationship with God himself. No part of the blessing can transfer into eternity. As the blessing is the one that Isaac is going to pronounce. Nothing has to do with character. <laughs> no part directly has to do with faith or hope in God. All of the blessing, every jot and tittle of it, has to do with life in this world, in the realm of time and prior to the resurrection of the dead. Apart from preparing the way for the Savior to come into the world, there's no connection, direct connection of these to eternal salvation. That's the kind of blessing we're talking about. And this is the kind of blessing that Moses talked about in Deuteronomy 28 that regularly in the mega churches and in the media is quoted as applying to the people of God today. Now, why is it this way? Why, was, why did he bless them? It all had to do with life in this world. Well, all, there are some things that are connected with salvation that were not in place at that time. I'm going to just give you a brief sampling of them because these are the things that have to do with eternity. Begotten to a living hope, opening the heart, faith, repentance, obedience, remission of sins, and you know, there's a lot of other things you could probably name more. Why is it this way? Why do we get all of these things and they got none of them? Except by faith, God gave them after they left the world. They got some of these things after they left. None of the blessings connected with salvation can be conferred on another person by a, by one by what person on earth not one single aspect of salvation can be transferred from one person who needs salvation to another person it's important to know this all these things i mentioned you you can't get them by proxy you cannot Everything that has to do with salvation is conferred by God himself. Laying on of hands is important, but no one ever got eternal life by laying on of hands. No one ever received remission of sins or justification or sanctification or the hope of glory by the laying on of hands. No, sir. No one ever got the fruit of the Spirit by laying on of hands. It's not conferred that way. Every person has to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. God gives it to you. It doesn't come. The blessing associated with salvation does not come to you through another person. The gospel comes to you, but it's God who gives the, the gifts and the benefits and so forth. In other words, God has no grandchildren. <laughs> All of this is over into the effective death of Christ which had not yet occurred. <coughs> now we'll take special note of, of the kind of blessings that he conferred. Therefore, God give thee of the dew of heaven. Okay. Yeah. Have, have you thought of any parallel between uh, this blessing being given to Jacob and men being blessed in the gospel being contrary to what they would otherwise receive by nature. So the, the, the blessing didn't belong to Jacob by nature, but he received it. Yeah. I and want to so touch what, on some things that I think that are, have to do with that. Go ahead. You, well, I just wondered, if, if it's a brand new thought to me, and so I thought I'd just ask you, if that is, is that like a seed of the gospel? Oh, that, yeah. That God is giving to men what by nature they would never, never otherwise that's have. That's right. Exactly right. Amen. Jacob didn't get this blessing by faith. <laughs> That's how he got it. He got it by confirmant. But it didn't have anything to do with after he died. Nothing at all. What we do does. This blessing was a shadow. Pardon? This blessing was a shadow. It was a shadow. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but I think in more, more detail than what I was thinking was God turning nature around. He was superseding what 
Oh, I see. But with saying. other natural, what yeah. would, by nature, what would transpire? He turned it around. Yes, amen. Which is what happens in us. Amen. <laughs> the dew of heaven. Now, the dew in Canaan is not like dew like we know about dew. It was very, very interesting to do a little research on it. I give you so kind of a capsule comment of it. But in, in Canaan, in that part of the world, particularly Canaan, the dew was the result of the hot summer air hitting the cold air of the night. It distilled and, and rained a mist on the ground and watered the vegetation for the heat of the day. Solomon talked about clouds that dropped down dew. It was at nighttime that it happened. And some, this uh, one resource said it was actually like a deluge, kind of like a deluge that when it distilled, it fell. You remember when God uh, fed Israel manna, that they got up and the dew was all over the ground. When the dew, the sun evaporated the dew, that the manna was left behind. It's the dew that kept the vegetation alive. They'd have rains like they have their, their early rain and the latter rain. That's, but in between, they had this dew or mist. <clears throat> so, I'm, so he's praying that, his, that he would always, his crops would never wither, no famine, that this dew would regularly water them. Now there's a marvelous type here, parallel. The average person who spends almost a third of their life asleep. The older you get, sometimes you spend a little more, maybe. When you're not, your will is kind of goes to sleep, too. When you're asleep. However, during these night seasons, some do. <laughs> Keeps you alive. Sometimes there's thoughts, sometimes visions, sometimes a dream, sometimes remarkable things come to your mind in your sleep. What is that? It's dew. It's spiritual dew. Yeah. Come on in the night seasons. <coughs> God said his doctrine would be like dew. As the dew is a small rain, so he calls dew a small rain. How's that? So it's, it's plentiful enough to keep the thing, to ready it for the daytime heat. Much of this comes during the nighttime, which ordinarily is associated with Satan. Darkness is more ordinarily associated with Satan. But in this dew, we have a picture of, of you're actually sustained in your night seasons by God. Psalmist one time said, when I wake, I'm still with thee. See? And haven't you had precious thoughts during the night of a lot of my messages I get in my sleep? What is it that's dew? Just like that. So God, that's built in the new covenant. <coughs> <coughs> and the Lord give you the fatness of the earth. Fatness of the earth has to do with the quality and perfection of the fruit that comes from it. Be like a hundredfold. <coughs> Be the opposite of your seed rotting in the ground, as Joel 117 states. <coughs> It's also the antithesis of what God said to Cain. He said, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. So this blessed is that the ground would yield its strength. Yeah, it is true. You, uh, it may be hard to read, but it is true that God can make the ground productive for one person and dry it up for another. Yeah. That's right. Well, it's true. Spiritually, it's true, too. <coughs> There's another type here seen. I'll give thee the fatness of the earth. A remarkable parallel with the Jews. <coughs> the, the scriptures are going to yield something to them. It didn't yield to anybody else, just like the ground yielded to Jacob what it did not to others. Jesus said one time, search the scriptures. <coughs> We'd say plow the field, plant your seed, you know. For in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. 
Me will not come to me, you may have life. Some people just plowed in the scriptures, studied the scriptures, studied the scriptures, never got anything. Didn't have the blessing upon them. Others have been blessed of God just to get a, it's like you get a deluge of stuff from the Lord. What is that? That's the Lord blessing you with the fatness of salvation. That's what that is. <coughs> and plenty of corn and wine. That has to do with the harvest. See, the fat of the fatness of the earth has to do with the quality of the fruit that it, it, it grows and comes to maturity. Big harvest and abundance. It's not an abundance like when it, Joseph told the Pharaoh they were going to have seven years of famine, but before they had it, they were going to have seven years of fatness. That's what we're talking about here. He didn't ask, he didn't bless Jacob with a seven years of fatness. He prayed that the fatness of the earth would be with him. <coughs> now there are some who gather a phenomenal amount of insight and nourishment from the word of God. You maybe know some people like this. They just always have bigger crops. Notice that? You say, oh, I wish I could. I wish I could give. Well, God hasn't placed like a limitation on it. There's a lot that can be gotten. I understand that. But there, there are some that are specially blessed. Labor in the word and the doctrine, they just, but it's not because they're smart, mm -hmm. it's because they're blessed. Amen. Amen. <coughs> it's not of man that wills or of yeah. man that runs, but Amen. of God that showeth mercy. Amen. Amen. Then he says, let the people serve thee and let the nations bow down to thee. Well, that's quite a, it's quite a blessing. Now, at any given period of time, the descendants of Jacob would, would be relatively small or comparatively small. Yet other peoples and nations would serve them. Now, there are at least two notable examples of this actually happening in Old Covenant times. When Nehemiah went to build the wall of Jerusalem, the Persian king Artaxerxes sent Nehemiah out, supplied his, what he needed to go, and he, he was accompanied by a letter to the keeper of the forest. Nehemiah reported the king sent a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God, my God upon me. Yeah. What was that? Other people were serving him. God made that happen. Israel had been in captivity. Here's another one. When Solomon built the temple, let me read this for you. Hiram, king, that's the king of Tyre. Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sendest me to me for, and I will do the all I desire concerning timber of cedar and, according, and concerning timber of fir. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea, and I'll convey them by sea and floats unto the place that thou shalt appoint me, and will cause them to be discharged there, and thou shalt receive them, and thou shalt accomplish my desire." in giving food for my household. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. What was that? <laughs> that was the blessing of Jacob, other people serving him. And it's written of David. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts, see. Let other people serve thee. <laughs> <coughs> now we have uh, another type of this, a type of scene here. In that other nations who have promised to come to Israel and serve them. And this hasn't happened yet, but God said it would. Here's Isaiah's, one of Isaiah's prophecies. The labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and of the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine. How's that? 
They shall come after thee in chains. They shall come over. They shall fall down under thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. No other God, we'd say. What was that? I'll make them serve you. Here's another one, Isaiah 55, 5. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee. Here's another one. Gentiles shall come to thy light, kings of the brightness of thy rising. Yet another one. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. Zechariah said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days shall it come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. What is that? That's other people shall serve thee. <coughs> There's a, yet another type. That's that the, the saints are going to have power over the nations. The extent of this, I don't know. I just know what the promise says. He that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my father. He was said, other people, other people will serve you. It's going to happen now. As I say, the full extent of it, we don't know, but the Daniel three times said the kingdom was going to be given to the saints of the Most High God. <laughs> and you'll be Lord over your brethren. Let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Well, as far as we know, he only had one, one brother, Joseph. Uh, Jacob only had one brother, but his offspring, he had other relatives that descended from that brother. Before Jacob and Esau were born, God revealed the elder shall serve the younger. <coughs> Later, Isaac will say to Esau, and Isaac, e Esau, behold, I have made him my, thy Lord and all his brethren have I given to him as servants. See, he's going to tell him. Years later, it was said of Esau's offspring, who were the Edomites, he, David, put garrisons in Edom throughout all Edom, but he put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. There it is. <coughs> Your brethren had an even more minute application of this in that Judah, from whom whose tribe Jesus came, Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. So that I'm showing you here that God, a lot was in this blessing here that prepared for Christ. Now, what about the type here? We have, is there a type here? Oh, yes, there is a type here. The old man, like Esau, was first. And the new man, like Jacob, was second. Yet the old man is subservient to the new man. <laughs> That's the result of being begotten again. It's most unfortunate that due to faulty teaching, few believers know this. Then he says, Cursed be everyone that curses thee. That's the same promise that God gave Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. Mm -hmm. I will curse them that curse thee. Later God would say to Israel, If thou wilt indeed obey my voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to thine enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. Would God do something like that? Well, there you have. Yeah. There you have. There you have it. So you certainly don't need to be thinking about any like retaliation or anything like that. <coughs> when Moab and Ammon rose up <coughs> against Israel, the Lord had this to say through Zephaniah. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord, 
the God of Israel. Surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding pits of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. You think God doesn't curse them that curse his people? Think again. Speaking to those who oppose and reproach his people, the saints are solemnly reminded by the apostles. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, Amen. saith the Lord. You don't have to take matters in your own hands. <laughs> yes. Now, Jesus spoke very specifically about the matter of neglecting, harming, or persecuting his, peop his brethren. He spoke about it very precisely. Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye did it not unto me. The result, these shall go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous to life eternal. In the end, whether a person goes to heaven or hell, is going to largely be decided by how they treated God's people. I mean, this is a startling thing to think about. On the other side, after they died, John saw some martyrs under the altar. They were very conscious of this thing, the Lord will take vengeance. And they asked, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Mm -hmm. I mean, some Jews up there now saying, What, what, what about Hitler? What, when's, when's this thing going to be straightened out? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All the billions of people that have been martyred for the cause of Christ. When's this all going to be corrected? They weren't rebuked. God didn't say, Oh, now you got to forgive these people. Not, not be thinking that way. He said, no, he said, uh, white robes, give them some white robes. And was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season till their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed, as they were, should be fulfilled. So there's more coming. I'm going to take vengeance on them all at one time. That's what God's going to do. Amen. To get vengeance on them all at one time. It doesn't make any difference if it's a worldwide Hitler or a neighbor next door, yeah. or a family member. Mm -hmm. Whoever messed with God's people, God's going to take vengeance. You don't do it. It is possible that they, God would give them repentance. I mean, we, that's, of course, that's our preference, but Amen. it's going to be settled one way or the other. <clears throat> Today, there's a very simplistic talk about forgiving people. Crops up every once in a while. I hear people talking about it. We should just forgive them. Forgive people. Even though they haven't repented. Now you should be ready to forgive. There's no question about that. But you cannot forgive someone that hasn't repented. If someone says you can, they just simply don't know what they're talking about. Not even God Almighty can, re can forgive a person that doesn't repent. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So see, repentance lies. But this is being taught God's people now. They lay a weight on God's people. You should be forgiving, even though that person is still a despot and still do, do them harm. No, you, you be ready to forgive. At the very instant it happens, if the fornicator comes back to Corinth, Corinth has to forgive him. But not until... I say that because it's a too much sloppy thinking about this subject. And I'll bless them that bless thee. <coughs> that word also was given to Abraham, you remember. I'll bless them that bless thee. Laban confessed to Jacob, God bless me because of you. I was good to you, God's been good to me. 
Potiphar was good to Joseph, took him into the house. God, and after he was good, after he was good to Joseph, then God blessed the house of Potiphar. <coughs> now, bless him, bless him. Even Balaam prophesied this. Even he said, "I will, I will bless him that bless thee." He said to Abraham and Balaam, confirmed, "Blessed is he that blesseth thee." It's a marvelous aspect of God's nature. On one occasion, there was a certain centurion unnamed in Jesus' day who sent the elders of the Jews uh, to Jesus, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And these elders came to Jesus and they said, He is worthy for whom you should do this. He loveth our nation. He blessed us. He loveth our nation. And he built us a synagogue. What are you going to do now, Jesus? So Jesus went with him, yeah. and he healed his servant. See, he blessed. This man blessed God's people, so God blessed him. Now, in our day, it's not uncommon to hear pretentious preachers say, now, brethren, you need to make more ungodly friends. This is the way we're going to bring them in, make more ungodly friends. See, I, I don't agree with that. I'm for telling the ungodly, you need to make some godly friends. Right. Amen. And so you'll come to see them, and maybe if you do them good, it, it, yeah. I'll bless them that bless them. You see, that's, that's the way it works. So they got the thing just turned around backwards. So make yourself, brethren, as comely as possible. For some of us, including myself, that will require a little more effort than for others, I know. But if you want others to bless you, then make yourself blessable. And you've got this promise, I will bless them that bless thee. <coughs> of course, the ultimate person is the Lord Jesus. God is pledged. <laughs> Whoever receives my son, I'll save him. Whoever rejects my son, I'll condemn him. So if you bless Jesus by receiving him, God will receive you. Isn't that good to know? <laughs> and if you reject Jesus, God will reject you. That's the way it is. The ultimate person. So the church needs to be clear about, about these things. All tip, typified in our text. But it's, just, it's just a lot to think about there. How God works things out. Circumstances you wouldn't, you wouldn't, ordinarily you wouldn't think God would work under circumstances like that. But he did because they didn't have the advantages that would cause it to go otherwise. You may be in some very difficult circumstances. It may seem like God can't work in them, but God can. God can carry his will out. In, in mysterious ways that you may not be able to understand and you wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you couldn't see the details of them but that, that's the thing that I think you want to get from this is to really trust God and you can be like Jacob in this regard do the best you know yeah, do the best you know how and seek to take hold of the things God has and uh, God will bless you. Oh, yes. Yeah, because we've been given much more. That's right. Mm -hmm. And, of course, to him who is given much of him shall much be required. That's right. Well, we better be doing more. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was a personal satisfaction to me not to feel compelled to condemn Jacob yeah. and Rebecca. Which, if they were living today, I, I would have a different view of it. You would too. This is no, this is no basis for justifying no. anyone doing anything in this mm -hmm. in in this time of light mm -hmm. and understanding and yes, life mm -hmm. and life that have been made known in the gospel. Mm -hmm. that these is are no, the kind that of people. No justification for us to do any. You can look at it this way: these are the best kind of people God had to work with. Yes, that's he right. worked with this. This, these people, in mm -hmm. spite of the handicap they had, God's will was done. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, great. Now, graduate up where we are in Christ. 
He's given us a lot more, but mm -hmm. God's will is going to be done. That's right. The only issue is whether you'll be part of it or not. That's Amen. Right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Anyone else? Sister Barbara. Yeah, I like to think about the sensitivity of Isaac in this passage also. You mentioned this. Yeah. And how he, he didn't feel that the situation was altogether That's true. Right. And so he followed that inclination. Mm -hmm. However, however small it may have started out, he was very persistent until he felt yeah, sure man. in himself yeah, that it had been confirmed. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it a little bit differently than you, because sometimes Satan had disguises himself as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. And so we may yes. have this inclination yes. that there's something not right about the situation. Amen. Mm -hmm. And not to think lightly of those inclinations. That's right. But to pray and ask the Lord. He, Isaac was creative mm -hmm. in the way that he went about trying to confirm the situation. That's right. And so we also work by faith good. in those things where we feel that there might yes. not be Very good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Isaac didn't know the time or the person that was working in him either. Mm -hmm. That's right. To confer this blessing. Mm -hmm. That's right. But that principle was working. It seems. Way. It seems as as it go, time goes on. It seems as though this whole matter cleared up to Isaac, but at the time he just didn't know. But he, he did know once he pronounced it. He couldn't. He couldn't reverse it and confer it on somebody else. And this is an example of Rebecca putting God before anyone else too. That's right. Because mm -hmm. I mean, you know, she waited until this point whenever yeah. Isaac was like saying, "Well, there's not going to be much time left, and I'm going to give the blessing." So. Obviously, she hadn't done anything before. That's right. But I'm sure she had to struggle with this, too. And she sure. decided, well, I'm going to do what God has said. God has gave, given me this, so I'm going to do what I think uh, would be the right thing to do. That's in this right. Situation. She didn't make an attempt to force Isaac into right. giving the blessing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. good. She, she she waited, and then she, she did the best she could. <laughs> but as I wanted to, wanted to underscore that was God was working in this. It wasn't really just all Rebecca or all Jacob. It was God working in this. So in the end, when you look back, you say this is of God. This no, no way could this have been brought in by, by man or by the works of man. This, this incident and the things that we've said about it and seen in it this evening magnifies for me the apostles' reasoning there in the letter okay, to the man. church of Rome. Amen. Yeah, it makes it even larger. Amen. And, and critical that we that we give attention to it. Amen. And see what we can see in it. it mm -hmm. Those are very large thoughts there. That's right. In oh, what yeah. we call Romans 5. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Then when Paul reasons on this incident in Romans 9, yeah, that's right. yeah. he says that it was done that the purpose of God according to election might stand. So that was the behind the scenes Work That's right. Amen. Right. Amen. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. It seems to me um, that this time, because the way you've outlined this, this time of hit in history, with the with their d diminished understanding and the diminished, there's no revelation yeah. on these things. Um, that this was the time. This was actually the perfect time for God to be able to bring these types in yeah. and do it in a just way. Yeah. I mean, you see, we looking at it, it seems like, well, some of it's kind of shady. But yeah. see, for the time, if God was going to show, if God decided to show these types and shadows, they're there. I mean, you can't look at Esau coming in, I mean, Jacob and Esau coming in there in these circumstances and not see all these parallels I know in it. spiritual life. So God was going to make this known. Where now we can look back on it and understand what's going on, but the, the time that he that he chose to do it was very important because he did it in such a time when there was no law. I can see how God did all this. Now, like you already said, you can't look at that and say, "Look how smart Jacob was." <laughs> You'll never come to that conclusion. No. But but this, I, I I just keep thinking about this, and I know that um, we don't have a lot of revelation on it, but but somehow. This ties in about him buying this birthright, because this oh, yeah, this, this, had, this justified this him. This had to be God. This, it, 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 I mean, it, it, Jacob was very tender towards yeah. owning the birthright, and yeah. he did. Yeah, so. yeah. This, this was God's preparatory yes. work. Amen. And also, I didn't mention this, but the smallness of the knowledge and nature of the time appeared to give Satan the advantage, uh -huh. yeah. right? This appeared to give Satan the advantage. So when Satan had this advantage, mm -hmm. God worked yeah. worked the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, he worked it out. 
All right, well, we had a lot of things to think about. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this record. We thank you for the faithfulness of Jacob and mm -hmm. Rachel and the sensitivity of Isaac and, and Rebecca and with the sensitivity of Isaac. Lord, we, uh, we lament that <coughs> they didn't have any more than they did, but we marvel at what they did with it. And we give you the praise for working these things out so that we would know of a surety that it is not of works, lest any man should boast. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>